Suppose science worked like creation myths, or like languages. Here we have a map of world languages. In this red area, English is spoken. There, Spanish is spoken. There, Russian is spoken. And it's quite natural that pe you should be able to, to plot a map like that, that people should speak the language of their country. But what if scientific theories were like that? What if we had a similar map of the distribution of scientific theories? Suppose in the red area, everyone believed the meteor theory of the dinosaur extinction. And in that area, everybody believed the virus theory. And in that area, everybody believed the mammals eating the eggs theory. Wouldn't that be a pretty silly sort of science? Imagine the scene, two scientists arguing, and one of them says, I believe that the dinosaurs went extinct because a comet hit the Earth. Why do I believe that? Because that's what my father and grandfather believed. And that's what people in my country have always believed. But I believe that it was a virus that drove the dinosaurs extinct. Why do I believe that? Because my father and grandfather believed it, and that's what people in my country have always believed. Or, suppose the conversation went like this. Never mind the evidence. I just know that a comet struck the Earth because it's been privately revealed to me that a comet struck the Earth. But I just know that it was a virus, because I just know it, because I just know it, because I have faith that it was a virus. If you overheard conversations like that, you'd think they were pretty odd scientists, wouldn't you? You'd see no reason to believe any of them. Growing up in the universe partly means evolving from simple to complicated, inefficient to efficient, brainless to brainy. But it also means growing out of parochial and superstitious views of the universe, growing up to a proper scientific understanding of the universe based upon evidence, public argument, rather than authority or tradition or private revelation. Growing up means trying to understand how the universe works, not copping out with supernatural ideas that only seem to explain things but actually explain nothing. Well, you might say, can we really afford to be snooty about the supernatural? After all, many of us have probably had uncanny experiences that sound like telepathy. We perhaps um, dreamt about somebody uh, which, whom we hadn't thought of for years, and then the very next day we had a letter from them, and we think, what an amazing coincidence. There must be something supernatural. It seems so spooky. That's a supernatural explanation. What would a natural explanation of an event like that be? Well, what we've got to do is to come to a proper assessment of how likely it would have been that this could have happened anyway, by sheer luck. And there are ways of doing that, and we can run a very simple experiment here uh, on a very small scale. We're going to do it by tossing pennies. It may be that somewhere in this audience is somebody who is psychic and is capable of willing a penny to come down heads or tails. And what we've got to do is to identify that psychic individual. So, uh, Bryson is going to toss a penny, and I want, he's going to, I'm going to, to ask everybody on this side of the, we'll forget about the gallery because I can't see them up there. Everybody on this side of me here is to will it to, be cut, to come down heads. Really think of it coming down heads. Try to make it come down heads. We'll try to see whether the psychic individual is that side. Or on this side, everybody should will it to come down tails. Okay, so off we go. Tails. Tails, right. So if we've got a psychic individual, it must be on this side. Right. Now, would everybody on this side then please stand up? And we're going to try to do this by elimination. Now, everybody on this side of the aisle, will it to become heads? Everybody on this side of the aisle, will it to come down tails? Heads. Heads. Sit down, please. Stay standing up. Now, it's got a bit of a problem here. Let's say... Everyone from behind the row that was holding up the ancestral portraits should will it to come down heads, and everyone from the ancestral portraits downwards, tails. Tails. Right, the back rows then sit down, please. Right, now we're narrowing it down. With how many tosses have we done? Three. Right. Now, one, two, three, four. Let's say the back two rows of those standing will it to be heads and the remainder tails. Tails. Back two rows, sit down, please. Right, now, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three. Okay, we'll make it simple. The, the back row heads and the front two rows tails. Tails. Back row, sit down. Um, 
Right. Um, back row heads, front row tails. 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 <laughs> now. <laughs> right. Um, let's say that from Coca-Cola to the left, <laughs> heads, and the other one tails. Heads. Heads. Down, please. No, no, Coca-Cola stand. Oh, right. Right. Um, heads, tails. Heads. Heads. Right. Well done. <laughs> um, how many coffees is that? I don't know how many tosses that was, but congratulations. Let us suppose that it was eight. It was, was it? Right. Now, what's your name? Who got it? Me. Yes. Johnny. Johnny. Yes. Well, can... Donny. Now, the question is, is he psychic? <laughs> he, managed to, um, he managed to get it right eight times in a row, and that's pretty impressive. But, of course, there's absolutely no evidence whatever that he's psychic. He did indeed think about heads and tails, and it did come down the right way. But if you think about how we set the experiment up with successive divisions, he could have thought about ham and eggs and it would have given the same result. It had to come out, because of the number of people here, it had to come out that somebody was um, uh, apparently psychic. Now, we've only got a few hundred people in this room, but if we could do this with a million people or two million people, we could have gone on tossing pennies for a very long time, and at the end of that time, we'd have got a very impressive result. Now, when people write into the papers with uncanny experiences, it's just like that. Because the circulation of a tabloid newspaper is up in the million, and if only one of them has to write in, then you can see exactly what happens. There's got to be somebody out there having an uncanny experience at this very moment, and it means absolutely nothing. So don't, whenever you hear a story about uncanny, spooky, telepathic experiences, think about this experiment and think about how likely it would be to come about anyway. Put your trust in the scientific method. Put your faith in the scientific method. There's nothing wrong with having faith. I'm going to move Faraday out of the way. There's nothing wrong with having faith in a proper scientific prediction. This is a heavy cannonball. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to release it. And it's going to come, it's going to go over there. And it's going to come roaring back towards me. And all my instincts are going to tell me to run for it. <laughs> but I have enough faith in the scientific method to know that it's going to stop just about an inch short, or perhaps less, of my head. <laughs> so here goes. felt the wind of it. The Nobel Prize winning scientist Sir Peter Medawar, in a book written jointly with his wife, wrote the following. Only human beings guide their behaviour by a knowledge of what happened before they were born and a preconception of what may happen after they are dead. Thus only humans find their way by a light that illuminates more than the patch of ground they stand on. Well that's all for today. In the next lecture I shall be turning to the problem of design and the difference between genuinely designed things like that electron microscope and apparently designed things that are not really designed like this elephant and like this swift. Thank you very much.